Welcome to the Spiked Podcast. I'm Ella Whelan, Assistant Editor at Spiked, and today I talk to Brendan O'Neill, Kathy Young and Lauren Southern about the rise of the alt-right. At Spiked, we've always been critics of the new authoritarianism. Censorship of speech in the form of paternalistic politics, trigger warnings, safe spaces and microaggressions is stifling public discourse. In response to this, there has been a surge of interest from young right-wingers in the alt-right or alternative right, a political movement that deliberately trolls, triggers and defies the regulation of speech. But is the alt-right's war against censorship working? Or do we need a better campaign to defend freedom of speech? To discuss this, I spoke to Spiked editor Brendan O'Neill, journalist Kathy Young, and reporter and student Lauren Southern via Skype. Kathy, you've written a piece this week for The Observer about the rise of the alt-right. But for those of us who don't know, what is the alt-right? Okay, well, the alt-right is actually something that has been around for about five or six years, I would say. I think that the actual term was coined even before that. It's a very loose kind of conglomeration of various people, websites, um, you know, bloggers, people posting on Twitter, who are dissatisfied, as they put it, you know, with the conventional uh, conservatism that exists in the United States. And are seeking to define a kind of alternative movement or alternative philosophy. The alt-right that I am concerned about and that I think has become very visible in um, social media discourse and that is kind of loosely connected to support for the Trump campaign, although, you know, I don't think that the Trump campaign has officially embraced it in any way. It's basically, I would say, a kind of white nationalist movement with a new label. I also uh, did a blog post the other day about a post by uh, Vox Day, which is the pseudonym of a sci-fi writer named Theodore Beale, uh, who's kind of an, like one of the unofficial spokespeople of the alt-right. He has a blog post Post about what the alt-right is, and he basically makes it very clear that it's a white identity movement, anti-non-white uh, immigration, but even more so, it really seems to be predicated on the assumption that even beyond skin color, even ethnic background is really the defining thing in cultural identity. Brenda, Cathy said that the alt-right hasn't just sprung out of nowhere that it's a movement that has been around for quite some time but why now I mean I didn't know much about the alt-right and now I you know can't move for hearing about it because they're almost it feels like they're everywhere well, why now <laughs> yeah I think Kathy's right to say that it's been brewing for quite a few years now and it's it's come to the fore recently but it has been there growing in various different ways for five or six years and I think In one sense, the alt-right is an entirely predictable response to the new political correctness, to the new cosmopolitan elites that tend to govern life in the West these days. Because what happens when you politicize lifestyle in the way that these kind of technocrats have done through the culture wars, through their kind of demonization of traditional communities and white men, you know, the new favorite bogeymen of our time and heterosexuals and, you know, laddish culture, all those things that mean something to a huge section of society. When you politicize and demonize those ways of life, you are going to invite a reaction against that. You are going to invite a rebellion against that, a kind of uprising against it. And I think that's what the alt-right is, or what it at least intends to be. But the problem with the alt-right is that it utterly lacks any ideas, any serious ideas for how to challenge this new authoritarian culture. And it even seems to lack basic political vocabulary for describing the climate we find ourselves in and for confronting it in a meaningful way. And I think what's happened as a consequence of the kind of very infantile nature of the alt-right rebellion against PC is that it has ended up becoming a mirror image of all the things that it hates. So, for example, one of the big problems of our time, I think, is the politics of identity and the way in which we're all invited to define ourselves by our race or our biology or our gender and so on. And the alt-right, instead of really picking that apart, actually starts to mirror it. So you have 
the politics of white identity, the politics of male identity. And they really just kind of adopt the politics they're supposed to be challenging. Also, they're very nativistic in a quite ugly way sometimes, this idea that only the natives of a country have a right to be here and a right to engage in public life. And we have to uh, get rid of non-white migrants in particular. It's an attempt to challenge multiculturalism, this kind of very amorphous, relativistic celebration of all cultures as equally valid. But even their response to that becomes a very kind of cack-handed celebration of nativism rather than a real challenge to the ideology of multiculturalism. And also, I think the alt-right has started to embrace quite a few conspiracy theories to try to describe the moment we find ourselves in. And these also start to mirror the theories put forward by the new elites and the PC brigade and so on. So, for example, where, you know, campus feminists will talk about the patriarchy, this very amorphous idea that there is this oppressive culture ruining women's lives, or leftists will talk about neoliberalism, this very free-floating idea that is apparently destroying the West. The alt-right's version of that is to use phrases like cultural Marxism. And they start to push this idea that there are these secret gangs of Marxists kind of marching through the institutions and really making life extremely hard for conservatives and white people and so on. And they start to adopt a very similar language as the people they're supposed to be opposing. The main thing I think they share with the people that they're supposed to oppose is a real victim politics. They start to conceive of themselves as being completely under siege at all times. And I think you can see that in Trump's campaign and the way in which Trump tries to appeal to his constituencies, which is basically by saying, I feel your pain. I feel the pain of white working class communities. I will validate you. I will give you recognition. I will fight your corner. It's a version of therapy politics. So what I find fascinating about the alt-right is it's an understandable reaction to the times that we find ourselves in. But it is so lacking in any kind of real serious politics that it ends up becoming the thing that it hates. And that's why I think it's very important now for progressives to challenge both the new authoritarian culture and also this reaction against it, which, if anything, has become uglier than the culture it's supposed to be challenging. And Lauren, you've in the past had some dealings with some parts of the alt-right movement. Does it deserve the bad rep that it gets? Is it, as Brendan and Kathy are saying, has it really taken things almost too far? Well, you know, it's hard not to sympathize with a lot of the alt-right causes, and I do align with a lot of them. I keep a healthy skepticism of any movement that I join or sympathize with or just talk about. I always keep a healthy skepticism, and the alt-right certainly deserves a healthy skepticism. But you can hardly blame a lot of these young people for uh, their reaction to failed media, their reaction to failed politicians, failed society, led by the media and politicians. And if people want to see who's to blame for the alt-right, if you're in the mainstream, all you have to do is look in the mirror. These people no longer want to play by the rules because the left's rules have uh, led to the right losing for the past 60 years. Why would they take the political ideas and approaches of the baby boomers who destroyed their countries? They're tired of it. So they are trying to take a new approach. Do I think they've picked a better method that will last throughout time and be this wonderful new uh, way of dealing through politics? No, absolutely not. But I understand why they aren't taking the normal route. And I understand why they're rejecting the suggestions and the uh, kind of political tone of the average conservative or right wing individual. And if I could just push you there, you know, uh, we understand that the reaction to the kind of PC culture, which I think we all share a very, very deep skepticism of this idea that microaggressions, trigger warnings, onslaught and stuff like that, where you absolutely want to see the end of that kind of uh, nonsense. But when the right response to outrage, it becomes outrageous. Is that a valid way of dealing with politics? You know, is that a, is that really a political response to a political problem? Now, of course, I've uh, founded things like the triggering. The sole purpose of it has to be offending people for the sake of defending free speech. Now, behind that, there was a political idea. There was a goal. If all of us say these things, we can't all be banned from these social media platforms. Now, of course, if you're going to make your whole life just about offending people with no other substance behind it, and you're just there to troll journalists, uh, it can be funny to watch, but it's 
yeah, it doesn't have a lot of political value and it's not going to have a lot of long term success. Now, wanting to have an honest discussion about culture, wanting to have an honest discussion about cultural Marxism, which I do think is a very real thing. I think the long march through the institutions is absolutely happening. Some of my professors themselves would be happy to admit it. A lot of this social justice nonsense, uh, race quotas, obsession over gender, the destruction of womanhood and the destruction of the nuclear family. This has been the goals of a lot of these radicals from the 60s, these tenured radicals. And I think an honest discussion about those things is needed. Kathy, if I can bring you in on that point, because basically we are defenders of free speech and it spikes, we're free speech absolutists. And so in the piece, you talk about the fact that these ideas espoused by the alt-right are dangerous. How do you then deal with it? I actually do think that the best way to respond to the alt-right is to respond to the excesses of political correctness. I actually do agree with Lauren that if we don't discuss those issues that really need to be discussed. I think we need to address the overregulation of speech. Uh, I mean, what we're getting in the United States, we're getting more and more examples every day of completely ridiculous overreactions to speech that is deemed to be, you know, racially or sexually offensive. In the tech uh, community just the other day, where this uh, gentleman named Douglas Crockford, who's a tech evangelist, sort of has been banned from a major conference because at a previous conference, he made a couple of comments that were construed as offensive, uh, one of which I understand was that he spoke of promiscuous versus committed users of technologies. And apparently some people decided that, you know, using the language of promiscuous versus committed amounted to slut shaming women. You know, I mean, this is really (laughs) almost too ridiculous to even to even describe. So I think, yeah, I I think one of the ways to respond to the alt-right is to respond to the kind of phenomena that it's responding to. So, yeah, I think the response to that is to respond to and, uh, you know, resist effectively the the sort of control political correctness and some of these, you know, cultural trends that, uh, that Lauren mentioned. But on the other hand, you know, I, I do think it's true that, uh, first of all, freedom of speech also includes the freedom of other people to say, you know what, like if you're, you know, if this is how you're going to express yourself, you know, you're, you're we're, we're going to tell you that you're a bigot and a jerk. <laughs> you know, I think that's, mm-hmm. that's a, that's a very basic part of freedom of speech. And I think that, uh, freedom of speech, I think also includes freedom of association. You know, if, if, I don't want to deal with someone who says, oh, you know, actually, I think Hitler had some awesome ideas. I I don't really have to deal with that. I mean, I can choose to exclude them from my social circle. And, uh, you know, if I is so I think that's that's really the response. I think it is more speech. Absolutely. Um, But I think it should be speech that. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, stigmatizes real bigotry and real hate. Uh, I mean, I think that that absolutely should be part of our response. And Brendan, do you think that it, you know, is it just a joke here like this or is there a danger? Do you kind of share Kathy's concerns about an actual danger of spreading some very real bigoted ideas out there? Well, you know, the alt-right will often say that they're just joking. And, you know, when they're trolling Leslie Jones, for example, the black actress from Ghostbusters, or when they're sending swastikas to Jewish journalists, they will say, you know, it's just a joke. We're just having some fun. We're just, um, you know, kicking against political correctness. It's very infantile, I think. Kind of reminds me when I was at Catholic school and we used to draw speech bubbles in the Bible with Jesus saying, I am gay and all this kind of stuff. You know, it was understandable when we did it because we were, you know, 10 years old. But these people are older and should know better. But, you know, there comes a point when you think to yourself, the anti-Semitism is not funny. Calling a black actress an ape is not funny. It's racism and it's repulsive and it should be challenged and confronted. And I think that's a very important thing for anyone who considers themselves liberal or progressive. And I know those words have vastly different meanings in America and Britain. But anyone who thinks of themselves as being on the right kind of liberal, decent side of politics ought to challenge that kind of stuff when it comes up. I think what the alt-right really represents is, you know, the the, the kind of um, the PC side, the identity politics side engage in virtue signaling a lot of the time to show how good they are. And in response, the alt-right engages in what we could call vice signaling. You know, how how bad can we be? How how repulsive can we be? How much can we stir up the sentiments of these very sensitive 
people who run campuses and, and, and run a lot of politics as well. So it's a very childish reaction to political and emotional correctness. I think what they see, they see a society that is increasingly where speech is being controlled, where thoughts are being policed, where there is very minute policing of even everyday conversation, which you see in ideas like microaggressions, which really invites a kind of social paralysis. And their attempt to kick back at that is to say all the things you're not supposed to say. That is not necessarily a good way to challenge censorship. So, for example, when the ACLU defended the right of neo-Nazis to march through the largely Jewish town of Skokie in 1978, they didn't become neo-Nazis. They didn't say all the things that the neo-Nazis were saying. They simply defended their right to say them. The, the big mistake that the alt-right makes is thinking that if something is unsayable, then you must say it, rather than <laughs> defending the right of people to say it, which is the proper, the grown-up liberal thing to do, whereas they have this very kind of infantile, almost temper tantrum response. Briefly, just to come back on some of Lauren's points, I really agree with a lot of the points Lauren made, but in relation to cultural Marxism, the reason I have a problem with that phrase is two reasons. Firstly, I think the extent to which the new left has taken over universities and various other institutions, which its values undoubtedly have, is primarily because the traditionalists and the conservatives or, or the people who believed in enlightenment, whatever we want to call them, they basically left the battlefield. You know, going back to the 50s and 60s, they vacated the institutions. They failed to defend them. They failed to defend Western ideals. They failed to defend the idea of the university, the idea of adulthood, the idea of autonomy, the idea of debate. And it was largely their failure to defend those things, which kind of threw the door open to new groups of people who could come in, be re very relativistic, be quite authoritarian do down Western culture, do down Western ideas, because they were almost invited to do that by the retreat of the establishment, if you like. So I think calling it a march through the institutions is, is slightly one-sided. I think the question in my mind is always, well, where were the people who were supposed to be guarding these institutions? And I think that's a really important historical question. And then the second reason, as someone who comes from a Marxist background, which makes me incredibly unpopular, I just think what we're seeing on campus in particular is not Marxism. Identity politics, to my mind, is the opposite of Marxism. And I think Kathy's right, actually, when she says that a lot of the PC culture is actually an attack, not simply on conservative values, but on what we would call progressive values and also on left wing values. Particularly, it really undermines the idea of universalism, the idea that human beings have a shared capacity to understand the world to enjoy freedom, to be grown up and to take responsibility for their lives. Identity politics really undercuts that by saying, for example, women are less capable of negotiating public life than men. Black people are historically very vulnerable to offence. White people are full of privilege and must constantly self-flagellate for the crimes of the past. It shoves us all back into these biological racial boxes that we spent so long trying to escape from and to my mind, that's the opposite of Marxism. That's the opposite of progressive left-wing politics. And I always say to right-wing people, if it's Marxism you're worried about, you should be absolutely delighted by the rise of the new left on campus. You should be delighted because they are hard evidence of the defeat of Marxism. They are hard evidence of the defeat of the universal ideals that used to drive left-wingers. So I think that kind of culture that the alt-right is failing to challenge and which liberals have been very complacent about challenging is actually as much, if not more, an attack on good left-wing values as it is on any kind of conservative ideas. Lauren, the goal is to stop this kind of crazy over-exaggeration of PC culture, to wind back the kind of mad things that we're seeing like trigger warnings, microaggressions, safe spaces, all the stuff we've been talking about. So in propagating this kind of uh, extreme reaction to that, being completely outrageous and saying terrible things, even if it's just to prove that you can and the world won't come to an end, isn't the alt-right basically feeding PC culture? Because the more that someone says something horrendously anti-Semitic or racist on Twitter or elsewhere, the more PC 
culture says, here's hard evidence that we have to kind of police speech. So now, is it a vicious cycle? Uh, yes and no. Of course, the left are ecstatic to finally find the their real racists and the real sexists. This is something they've been looking for for a very long time. So they've finally put them up on a pedestal and said, we found them, we found them. Here they are. I, I think that uh, you have to take into consideration that these labels would exist anyways. And that when someone sees a Nazi, something that they are so politically not aligned to, something that they deem a threat to their ideology, a threat to their lives, in fact, they want to crush it. And that means the right wing in general to a lot of extreme leftists for a very long time, regardless of the alt-right. That's going to keep happening. And even if the alt-right did disappear, I think that leftists would want to crush conservatism. It's a, a little... I think, silly to say that it is just the alt-right that is ruining things for us, because I think that PC Mm. culture and progressivism would have kept going anyways, as it has for a very long time. And I do agree um, with Brandon on this, that it does come from a failure of conservatives to defend or preserve anything other than their own ideology, as well as I do think it was Marxist in the institution. But I also want to make the point that I'm not worried at all about inter-memes. Of course, I don't agree with them. I defend the right of people to send Nazi memes to journalists. Do I find them particularly funny or clever? No. And do I disagree with the fascist ideas behind them? Of course. And I'm not going to sit there and say I love what they're saying, but the idea of having to disavow every little thing is very silly. And I think it's silly to ask Donald Trump to disavow every little thing his followers say. But these people are really not who I'm worried about right now. I think we have to be introspective, recognize radicalism on our end of the spectrum, or my end of the spectrum, rather. But they really aren't anything to be worried about compared to the left right now that have a grip on the institutions. It's only going to get worse from here. And I don't think uh, the alt-right is going to be our biggest concern uh, compared to the radical left. Although, of course, be introspective and recognize radicalism on your own end. And Cathy, last word from you on what you think has to happen from now. Do we need to launch a double attack both on PC culture and on the alt-right? Yeah, I think we do. Uh, I mean, I I think I I do actually agree with Lauren to the extent that PC culture has much more institutional power. But I do think that the alt-right is really part of a vicious cycle that if it continues unchecked, I think it absolutely will make PC culture worse. I think it will alienate uh, kind of liberals and moderates. So yeah, I absolutely think that we need to uh, reject extremism and radicalism on that side as well. I think we really need to stand up for universalist values, as Brandon said. And by the way, universalist is really one of the kind of dirty words in the vocabulary of the alt-right as well. So we really do need to, um, as I said, you know, consider the excesses on both sides and stand for uh, kind of enlightenment values, really. Brilliant. Thanks. And Brendan, just finally, if we want to help progressive ideas, universalism, decent behavior to win out, what do we do now? Put the question to you. Where do we move now to kind of stop this really quite abhorrent behavior happening uh, online, but also win a society in which free speech is absolute? I agree with Lauren and Kathy, which is that fundamentally we need to challenge the climate in which something like the alt-right has become possible and also actually predictable, which is, uh, I think, basically, we need to repair public life adult public life, open public life, a public life that is devoted to good ideas, strong debate, treating adults as autonomous people who can understand things and make judgments and engage and so on and so forth. Instead of what we have, which is, you know, under the culture wars or whatever people want to call the current climate, we have the relentless politicization of personal life, of lifestyle, of, you know, certain identities, how people live And I think that's giving rise to a lot of bitterness, a lot of division, and it is also the source of censorship today. So I think the the real problem is the shrinking of public life, the intensification of personal identity. And what that does is it gives rise to a PC culture, which is constantly about clamping down on discussion and about kind of treating enlightenment ideas as bad. But it's also given rise to a rebellion which actually takes place on the same moral plane. 
on the plane of identity politics, on the plane of victim politics, and actually on the plane of censorship. So a lot of alt-right people will also call for the censorship or the censure of things that they find offensive, like, for example, Beyonce doing a black power dance at the Super Bowl or, you know, various other things that, that goes against their outlook on life. So I think the real problem is the shoving of everyone back into lifestyle, cultural, biological boxes. We need to repair the public world and in, invite people to engage in free, open discussion about the values of society rather than obsessing over their own identity and the idea that it's constantly under siege. You've been listening to the Spiked Podcast. To get your daily dose of spiked opinion, head to spiked-online.com Subscribe to our podcast feed, and if you'd like to help Spike continue to thrive, be sure to make a donation. Thanks for listening.